And now we're going to deal with the seven churches. We've already seen that we are supposed to read it in a historic, continuous way. Blessed is he that readeth, and that hear the word of the prophecy, and keep the things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. Revelation 1.3, the time is for each time in history, there was a time at hand. And of course, particularly for our time. I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And then we looked at the great Epinados in Revelation chapter 1, telling us that Jesus is the center of the whole book, the whole Bible, that He is the great I Am. We looked at how in the book of Genesis, man lost access to the tree of life, death came in, he had to earn his bread, lost dominion, became naked and was driven from God. And we looked in the first chapter on how there was a restoration to come in uh, access to the tree of life, victory over death, the hidden manna, Jesus, the one that would take away the spiritual hunger for all time, dominion was to be restored, white clothes, and no more separation from God. And we also saw in that first chapter, very briefly, that the seven churches represent the old postal route, starting with Ephesus, going to Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Isn't it amazing that that is the sequence in which they occur, and how the postal route went, and it's also the sequence in which they are mentioned. God is truly amazing. Write the things which thou hast seen, then time application, the things which are, and the things which are hereafter, future application, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in the right hand of the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels, the messengers, if you like, of the seven churches. The seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So the church is the medium through which Christ disseminates the truth. So let's go to Turkey, Asia Minor, where we find these churches. This is the city of Istanbul. And here you'll find some of the most beautiful mosques in the world. You'll find remnants here of the great battle between the religions, the Ottoman Empire, great fort of the Ottomans, bridges over the Bosporus, marriages, people living there today like they live everywhere in the world. Everybody is seeking a place in the sun. Everybody is looking for someone to love. This is a young couple that is engaged. She's wearing pink here. And uh, there's the coach on top of one of the seven hills of Istanbul, Constantinople. It's one of the cities with seven hills. Rome is the other one with seven hills. It's interesting that both were capitals of the Roman Empire. And uh, here is the great blue mosque in Istanbul. Tremendous building representing one of the great religions of the world. And we'll be dealing with some of these issues as we go on in the book of Revelation. This is Saint Sophia, very interesting place. It's a museum today. It used to be in Byzantine times, it used to be a Christian church when the Muslims took over during the post Byzantine period. They changed it into a mosque and today it's a museum. It's interesting that in this church they had the Christian reliefs paint up, painted up against the walls and when the Muslims took over they whitewashed them. They just took whitewash and they painted over them. And so they were gone to the site. And now over the ages the whitewash has faded. So when you walk into the church you actually see the Christian reliefs peeping through and you see which is something which to me is quite symbolic. It seems as if the great barriers between the religions are just coming down and uh, they're sort of blending into one. And interesting time 
that the world is facing. This is the, the uh, underground channels where you can do your shopping. It's very dark down there. Of course, a very interesting country, Turkey, one of the great countries to visit. Excellent uh, facilities, beautiful food, third world, first world, all in one. The great city of Troy was there, and so it's the remnant of that city. And uh, this is what's left of the town of Troas. This is where Paul preached one night, and he must have been uh, uh, a tedious preacher who kept on for hours and hours, such as myself, because poor old Eutychus couldn't take it anymore, fell asleep like they sometimes do in mine too, and crashed down from the window and broke his neck, and the miracle took place where Paul prayed over him, and he was healed. This was the place. Today it's just a little harbour place where fishermen sort of launch their boats. And uh, this is where we have the setting of the seven churches in this area. So each of the seven churches where Christ is represented as disseminating his light to the world, each of these names have a particular meaning. And they have a prophetic meaning. There's a certain character in each of these churches that is described, which applies to them at that time and has a future application into the future. Then the churches get a commendation, something that they are doing right. And uh, it's interesting that there is a church that does not have a commendation, but we'll come to that later. Then there is reproof, and reproof is very important because it tells us something about the time period again. If you are being reproved and asked to repent, is probation then over, yes or no? Obviously not. Because if you can still repent after reproof, well then probation cannot be over. And so you cannot take this prophecy and throw it into the future after the close of probation. That would do violence, not only to the terminology, but would do violence to the structure where it occurs. It is set by the chiasma into the historic arm. Christ is ministering in the holy place, not in the most holy. So this is a time period of his ministry which does not pertain to the time of the end, although the prophecy proceeds throughout the entire Christian time, even into that time. So there's a reproof, there's a counsel, and then there is a promise. That's the basic structure of all the letters to the churches. Now the first one is the town of Ephesus. It was a very prosperous town today. These are the ruins of Ephesus. Here is the great street of Curet. This is where Paul must have walked when he ministered in this particular town. And the name Ephesus means desirable. So it's a desirable condition to be in. This church has something going for it. And if it is the first in a period, because remember it says what is, and what is to come, historic, continuous, until the end of time, because that's how God works. He has concern for every generation. Then it must be the first period of Christianity, and uh, if we study the events, we can put an arbitrary time on it, probably to about AD 100. And we can learn something about the what is, what it was like then, as it applies to the church in history as well. Well, in Ephesus, there was the seat of Diana. And Diana was the mother of the gods. This is where Paul had his great argument about this very issue because he said Jesus is the only way and then there was this big tumult because they said no no he's putting down Diana our goddess and uh, they wanted to take him to task. So she was the mother of the gods. There was a temple of Diana which was built in 480 BC. It's interesting that uh, the Christian council, the council of Ephesus was held in this very town, Ephesus, and there the title, Mother of God, was given to Mary. 
So there's some interesting little correlations over there with the seat of the mother of the gods and here a title was given to Mary in this town as well. So that's the setting of this church. Let's read the letter to the church. Revelation chapter 2 verse 1 to 3. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. We've dealt with this text already. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. That's the commendation. So Jesus is saying to them, I can see what you're doing, I am happy with what you are doing, and you have discernment between good and evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles. So even in this early period, there were some who were trying to lead astray, yes or no? But they tried them. And what was the standard whereby they discerned whether they were from the good side or the bad side? Must be the word of God. That's the standard. How they, you tried them, and which say that they are apostles and are not. So they were deceivers and liars then in the early church. And we will see that in the lectures that come. And has found them liars. How do you find them liars? What standard do you use to find them liars? Your feeling? Or must you have something to base it on? Surely you must have something to base it on. The word of God. And has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. That's a good commendation for the church at Ephesus. They still had their act together. But there's a reproof. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So that first fire that the church had, that fire that you feel when you become converted, and you go off and you run to bring the message, they had cooled down somewhat. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, turn around, and do the first works. So complacency had set in to an extent, but they knew right from wrong, that was good. They worked and labored for God, that was good. But that firstborn zeal, that was slightly tainted. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place. So here was a time period that if a church did not live up to whatever truth they had, then God would do what? Take that candlestick away from them and give it to someone else. Very important point. So in this time period, we're still dealing in a time in history that if you don't live up to the light that you have, God will eventually take the light and give it to someone else to carry. But this thou hast, that thou hatest. That's strange. God hates something. And he commends them for hating something here. Hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Huh. Remember now, this is a very important point. God hates the deeds. Does he hate the people? No. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. God loves people, but he hates false systems of worship. So the early church had the discernment to hate the Nicolaitans. Who were the Nicolaitans? What were they? Nicolas, Nicolaitan. They were a group that taught, they were a sect, a Gnostic sect, that taught that the law of God did not apply to man in the flesh because man was spirit and flesh, and therefore what he did in the flesh did not apply to his spirituality. It's a very common thought today as well. So what the Nicolaitans taught then, they teach today. Nicolas was Poseidon worship. It was the god of the sea, the Nicolaitan. Nicolas? 
Nicholas. Have you heard that name today? Yes, today we worship at the shrine of St. Nicholas. You won't find him in history. You can look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica. It says that he is a fictitious individual, probably from Poseidon worship. Very interesting. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is Saviour. Jesus Christ is the one who saves us. Now we celebrate his birthday on what day? The 25th of December. Now the Bible says that the shepherds were out on the fields. So it couldn't have been the 25th of December. The god Zeus, his birthday was on the 25th of December. The god Osiris, his birthday was on the 25th of December. I can go through all the ancient gods the chief deities had their birthday on the 25th of December. Now if Christmas, which means Christ Mass, was really the birthday of Christ, then why are we celebrating Nicholas on that particular day? Isn't that interesting? And the kids are asked to ask whom for their gifts. Nicholas, and he rides through the sky just like the ancient gods rode through the sky on the 25th of December on a chariot drawn, if he was Zeus, by a goat. But if he happened to be a Nordic god, and we have a Nordic religion because that's where we come from, we come from the Goths, then he happened to be drawn by reindeer, and he could discern right from wrong, he was eternal, he lived forever, year to year, he could tell which child was good and which was not. He handed out the gifts and there he went on the 25th of December. And children today forget about Jesus Christ and say, Father Christmas. Is that right or wrong? So actually what we are celebrating is Nicholas Day and we love the Nicolaitans. But the early church hated them, not the individuals, but the system. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God, Revelation 2, 4 to 6. Today Christ is being supplanted by the system in a little way, but it's much worse than what it actually appears. Here's the street of Curet. And this is where Paul must have walked down. This is where all the statues of the leading figures of the town stood. And each one had a head on. And if you had lots of money, you had a sculptor make your head and place it on there. And you paid rent, like you pay for your telephone or whatever, your house. And if you ran out of money and defaulted on your payment, poof, off came your head. And somebody else's went on there who could pay the rent. And so when you walk down there, there you were in your full glory if you could pay the rent. Here was a temple to the Emperor Trojan. Temples like these, of course, were dedicated to many gods. And the emperor was, of course, the Roman emperor was a deity. He was a reincarnation of the sun gods. The town hall, as it was, beautiful library in Ephesus, Temple of Domitian, another emperor worship, another part of it. Then you had, of course, the ancient scholastica figures. Here, later on, the Byzantine church left its marks. And uh, if you were into plumbing, the plumbing was good. These pipes lasted throughout all this time. That was the public toilet. And underneath there was a river, so that whatever happened was immediately transported away. Nothing's changed. We also have a river. We just pull a chain to get it going. And uh, there you sat, and you could chat to your neighbor about whatever was happening in your life. <laughs> Here were the scholastica baths, the goddess Artemis, the one with the many breasts to feed the nations. And this was the amphitheater in which all the tumult took place. 
when the gold or the silversmith uh, who was responsible for making all the statues of Diana got very upset when Paul preached a different God. And uh, the story goes that Paul escaped from here. So this early church, commendable church, it uh, stuck to the ways, it had discernment between good and evil, it didn't allow pagan worship to infiltrate into the church, they discerned between right and wrong, Jesus was the center of their religion, they were a little bit complacent but otherwise pretty good. The first time period was the same. Ephesus was a harbor city and today there's no harbor, in fact the sea is many kilometers away, has been filled in by silt, and about 800 AD it ceased to be a harbor city. It's interesting in terms of time and evolutionary sequences, uh, this study. In Ephesus today, you find that Rome has set up this structure, which was apparently seen in a vision as the place where Mary lived, because John came from Ephesus and Jesus said, Behold your mother, and so he took her to live with him in Ephesus, but this has been determined to be a fake. But nevertheless, this is where many come to worship at the feet of Mary. All religions come to worship there. Catholic, then we have uh, pilgrimages of Protestants, even Islamic nations come to that particular place. Well, the next time period is Smyrna. 100 probably to 313 AD because this was a time period of tremendous persecution. The word mir is hidden, hidden in the word smyrna and it means sweet smelling, an aroma of sacrifice. Now if you take the city itself there was a shrine to the goddess Nemesis, Polycarp was their first minister and he was martyred. Interesting. And in this depiction over here, we have a ten days of persecution, the Bible says take a day for a year. Was there a period in the early church history when there was tremendous persecution for about ten years? And the answer is yes. There was an emperor by the name of Diocletian who decreed a persecution time period which was very acute and ended in 313 AD, so from 303 to 313, when Constantine put on the garb of Christianity over his pagan body. And Christianity became the official religion. So let's have a read what it says here to this particular church. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. So they were having a tough time. The early church grew very rapidly. Things were going pretty well until this religion started to challenge the official religion. And then persecution broke out. And as soon as you challenge the paradigms of the world, persecution. I know thy works, thy tribulation, thy poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews. Christians, the early church used the word Jews for Christians interchangeably. And are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So there are two churches on this world. Those representing God and his son, and those representing another power. Now this church has a commendation here, but there's no reproof, none whatsoever. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you in prison, and there you may be tried and shall have tribulation ten days. There you have a particular time period mentioned. Diocletian persecution took that time period. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. There's the promise of restoration. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt by the second death. Interesting theology there that we can deal with in later lectures. 
Revelation 2, 10 to 11. So here is a church, no reproof. It's one of only two churches in these seven churches that has no reproof. Only a commendation. So this is very desirable. But what did it take to get them like that? Persecution. You see, under times of persecution, the dross is separated. And what happens under persecution is that those who are known for their form of religion, they fall away because it becomes too painful to hold on to the form. So they give it up. So if you really want to stand in times of persecution, you better be grounded on the rock. You better know what you believe and why you believe it. And that is why the book of Revelation is very important. Because it's telling us that there will be a time of trouble such as never was. And we'd better believe what we believe if we want to stand in that time. So, was there ever such a persecution? Was there ever a Diocletian? Well, I'll take you back to that city of Palms, Palmyra, with this long Roman column, as we saw it in the, the previous lecture. And uh, here are the pillars of the Bell Temple in the background, and these great arches. And as you go through that city, you come to this board which says Diocletian camp. Interesting. So this emperor had his camp and his soldiers here from where he conducted his persecution of the early Christian church. Very interesting. And this persecution cleansed the church of all hangers-on for bread and fish. But those who clung to the rock, they were commended. So this was the great Diocletian camp. And modern Smyrna is called Ismir. It's quite a modern capital over there. This is all that's left of ancient Smyrna, not much. But it tells an interesting story in time. These are young people laughing and having fun in Smyrna like they have everywhere else in the world. You know what? I think God loves them. And God would love them to have a full knowledge of the truth as he would like you and me to have a full knowledge of the truth. But... If you have truth and you stand for it, this is what can happen. Persecution. This is the Colosseum where they were per persecuted, where Nero set the Christians alight. He used them as human torches. They were fed to the lions. Great suffering and death took place here as uh, people were destroyed through hatred between religions. Well, let's see whether they compromised. Pergamos means elevation, lift up. Lift up what? <coughs> lift up the self over the divine. Have we heard today about self when you switch on the television? Don't you hear that you have to find your strength in your where? Inside. And you have to change yourself from the inside. And you have to do all these things yourself. That's the new way to salvation. Pergamos lifting up man's way over God's way. And that is idolatry. So the capital of the Roman province of Asia, there was a temple of Zeus, also of Asclepius, the serpent god. Man instructing serpent, the healing serpent, wrapped around the pole. Do we use that symbol today? Yes, the medical world uses it today. The proconsul of Pergamos had a double-edged sword. And it's very interesting that this city was the bastion of the Babylonian priesthood. You see, when Babylon had been conquered by Medo-Persia, they took over the Babylonian religion. But the priesthood revolted against, Pergam, against the Medo-Persia, and so the priesthood was driven out, and the priesthood established itself here at this city. So here was the official ancient Babylonian priesthood. Interesting. 
They took the palladium stone, the vestments, which were the vestments of Dagon. They had a fish robe and they had a fish mitre with an open mouth on their head. Very interesting, because they represented Dagon, the god of the fish. And he was called Pontifex Maximus, the bridge between heaven and earth. So you were saved by man's mediation, the mediation of the church, rather than the mediation of Christ. So he was the bridge between heaven and earth, the keys and the mitre with them. So he had keys, two keys, the key to heaven and the key to hell. Interesting. And they were called Pontiff Kings of Pergamum, and the last one was Attalus III. Now he became a Christian. Uh, no, not Attalus yet. Later they became Christians. But Attalus III, when he realized that Rome was going to take them by force, he bequeathed his title to the Roman Emperor. So if you go to Rome today, you will see behind the Roman Emperors the letters PM. Pontifex Maximus, bridge builder. And the Roman emperor, as we saw, were gods. So you could pray to them. They were the one who opened heaven for you. Now it's interesting that you will find those same letters, PM, not only behind the names of the Roman emperors, but you'll also find them behind the names of whom? The popes. You will find P.M. Pontifex Maximus. So this title came down in history through the Roman emperors and eventually also to the pontiffs of Rome, who, by the way, also have the two keys, which they refer to as the keys of Peter, and they have the same vestments with the mitre that represents Dagon. How did that come into the Christian church? Now in AD 378, the Christian emperor Gratian refused the title. So here were the Roman emperors, and here's one who said, no, I don't want this title. So it lay vacant until it was seized by Damascus, the bishop of Rome, and this is how the title came to be part and parcel of the Roman pontiff. So we still have the title today. But what happened here at Pergamos? Well, this was the time when this compromise came in. Now, at Pergamos, you have this great, great Pergamos uh, altar, which was, of course, the altar to the gods, all the gods of the Pantheon. Tremendous battle is depicted here between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And Revelation 2, chapters 12, verses 12 to 14 say, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things, says he, which has the sharp, sharp sword with the two edge. That's the word of God. Jesus is writing about the word of God, and here is another one who also has a sword. But he is an earthly mediation. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. He's talking to his church, remember. They're dwelling where? Where Satan's seat is. Wow. So this priesthood, which supposes to be another Babel, portal to God, is an abomination of Satan. Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name. So this church still held to the truth in the midst of these circumstances. And has not denied my faith, even in the days when Antipas, a very interesting name, my faithful martyr who was slain amongst you where Satan dwelleth. Second time that it says that. So here was someone who was preferred, who preferred to die rather than give up his faith. And he calls him Antipas. Now Antipas could be, some say, a historic figure. And some say it is this one or that one or whatever um, pastor of that church was faithful at that time. But the word antipas also means anti-pontiff. So it could be spiritual that this individual who claimed to be the one who mediated for you between God and man 
And so mediation had moved from God, Christ, to man, that he was a problem. And people were commended for being antipas. But I have a few things against thee. Here's a reproof. Because thou hast there in them that hold to the doctrine of Balaam, mm -hmm. who taught Balak to cast the stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So something had been sneaking into the church here because there are those that hold to the doctrine of Balaam. Now we've discussed that. What was the doctrine of Balaam? Compromise. Get them to sin. Get them to break the law of God. And then we'll have them. So here is a compromise coming in where there is a doctrine being taught which will lead the people astray and they will start serving other gods. And that's what's going to happen to the Christian church. God is warning here. Watch it. Compromise is going to come. Constantine did this. Constantine said, let's marry the churches. Let's not have this constant battle between Christianity and paganism. Let's marry them. So he issued a medallion on which on the one side he serves Jesus Christ and on the other side he has his pagan deities. But he had a problem. Constantine had a problem. Do you know what that was? The word of God. Constantine had a problem with the Word of God because the Word of God <coughs> cut like a double-edged sword. And so, what did he do? He said, let's compromise. I'm going to give a whole lecture on this. And he got his priest, Eusebius, to rewrite portions of the Bible. And he sent them out, and 50 copies were made. And they were written so that Jesus Christ would become less than what he was. So that there could be a marriage between the religions. And Zoroaster could stand next to Jesus Christ. And Zeus could stand next to Jesus Christ. And Apollo could stand next to Jesus Christ. And everything would be honky-dory. We can worship them both. It was an ecumenical document that he commissioned. So a compromise came in and Jesus had to become less and obedience to God was replaced by obedience to man. Problem. Doctrine of Balaam. So hast thou also them that hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Oops! First they hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, now they held to the doctrine. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone and a stone, a new name written, which no man knows, saying, saving he that receiveth it. Compromise is the greatest evil of all because it is so deceptive. It is so deceptive. Here is this great city. These are the people that live there today, the marketplace. It is still third wall, the red wall, of the outer wall, the temple of Dionysus, the temple of Trojan, the temple of Zeus. There is a well that Kaiser Wilhelm made because he took everything away and carried it away. Scholastica and Asclepius. That was the worship that came in in Pergamos. Compromise. I would like to recommend today that compromise between error and truth be rejected and Jesus and his truth be made eternal in the heart. So the next time period mentioned is Thyatira, AD 538, probably to 1517. It has many meanings, this name. It means sweet savor of labor. It means sacrifice of contrition. And some say that it also means Satan's teachings. So after the compromise came in, and clearly we see that Balaam's te technology was used, 
Nicolaitans were acceptable, whereas the early church rejected that teaching. Here we have a time period of darkness. 538 AD, probably. The Justinian decree went out to appoint the Bishop of Rome as the corrector of heretics. So now the Word was no longer the component which decided right from wrong, but a human individual had taken the role of deciding for you what you should believe. That's a problem, wouldn't you agree? If God created us free agents, and we individually have to stand before God one day and give an account for what we have done and what we have believed, can we then say, oh, but he decided for me, yes or no? No. What happened when Adam and Eve sinned? What's the first thing they did? Blamed someone, right? Yes. When God said to Adam, what have you done? What did Adam say? Who the woman you gave me was her fault. And when he looked at the woman, what did she say? Who oh, was the serpent that beguiled me? You remember that? So once we start getting into that mode, we start blaming someone else. You know, we are living in a blame society today. Have you noticed that? Nobody has a problem on this planet. No child has a problem on the planet. I have my problems because of my parents. So here was now a corrector of heretics. Here was someone who decided for you what you had to believe, and if you didn't do it his way, what happened to you? Sizzle fits. That was the end of you. So it must be this time period when man became the standard for everyone else. It's called the Dark Ages. Once you reject light, and you assume to be light, that's when you have darkness. If the Son of God is not the light of the world, and someone else becomes the light of the world, then you have darkness. There's just no other way. So Holzhauser, who is a Roman Catholic theologian, says it is the Church of the Middle Ages. Now, in this particular city, you had a temple of Apollo, that's the sun god, and you had an altar to a female goddess. The Church of the Middle Ages had a god, and they had deified a female. We'll come to that later in the lectures. There was a textile industry in this particular city, where they made dyes, purple and crimson dyes, made from a root known as madder root. Now, the colors purple and crimson are also the colors of the Church of the Middle Ages. Very interesting. And the colors have very particular meaning. Purple is the color of royalty. Crimson is the color of sacrifice. So they have assumed the position of royalty and sacrifice which should accrue to none other than Jesus Christ. They have set themselves up as the norm. They are the ones who forgive sins. They are the ones who says, come unto me and I will give you rest. Come unto me, confess your sins to me and I will give you absolution. Whereas Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. Confess your sins to God. So here, here was a problem coming in. Then in this story, as it unfolds in the city, there's a story of Jezebel. Now if you look in the Old Testament, Jezebel was the princess of Phoenicia, who married Ahab, who was the king of Israel, and led the whole of Israel into sun worship. You can read the story there in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 4, 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 22. Jezebel led the people of God into Baal worship. And you had in that time, if you read the story, you had priests of Baal and you had priests of Ashtoreth. Now Ashtoreth was the female deity that was worshipped. So you had a male deity and a female deity. This is interesting. And you could pray to either. 
And you had priests of the one and priests of the other. Now the Church of the Middle Ages did exactly the same thing. You have an entire priesthood dedicated to Mary. And you have a priesthood dedicated to a male deity. It's interesting. I know thy works and charity, love, and service, and faith. Remember that the letter is written to God's church living in those circumstances and sometimes drinking from that fountain. That's the sad part about it. And thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. So here's works orientation. Now let me not get this wrong. There's nothing wrong with works because faith without works is dead. But if works take the place of faith, then your faith is dead. Are you with me? So, here was a church that shifted the emphasis from faith to works. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest, that means tolerates, that woman Jezebel. Now, there might have been a literal Jezebel there. They say that in that time period there was. She was the woman who was in control of the textile industry, who made the purple and the crimson uh, dyed cloths. But obviously, the Bible is using something literal, what was then, and applies it in a future application, and applies it to this great apostasy, which happened when Ahab, who was king of Israel married Jezebel. In other words, he went into a relationship with paganism. Is that clear? And here is this king who marries into paganism. So the church of God accepts paganism and intermingles it into its very fiber. So they suffer this woman they tolerate Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess. Now to prophesy means to preach. It also means to receive visions, and you have to take from the context which one you're dealing with. Obviously here, they're preaching to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, to become unfaithful to God and to serve other gods and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Wow, that's getting pretty specific. Idolatry and eating and drinking becomes part of the idolatry. Now God had always warned these people not to eat food sacrificed to idols, and here was a specific idolatry. It's interesting that the pagan deities, Bacchus, Zeus, Osiris were worshipped with round, wafer round breads symbolizing their bodies, literal bodies. Did that come into the church system at this time? Well, it did. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. God gave her time, lots of time to repent. But the sad story is, she repented not. And behold, I will cast her onto a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. But they won't repent. So the system won't change. It will remain. So God will have to take this light, give it to something else, because this system is not going to repent. It's a problematic system. And I will kill her children with death. So out of the system there will even be children who will be as apostate as she was. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So if works is your criterion, I will judge you by your works. If you lead people into idolatry, I will judge you by that. But unto you, I say, unto the rest, 
in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, so not everybody followed, there came a great split in the church. And which have not known the depth of Satan. Now, this is interesting technology. To know the depths of Satan means that you must be initiated into the secrets of occultism. Is that right? There are people today who claim to know the depths of occultism. And we'll have to find out where this depth of occultism is seated today. And we're going to do this in the lectures that come, in no uncertain terms. But here it is seated in which church? The Church of the Middle Ages. Knows the depths of Satan. Wow, that's scary. We're going to have to deal with this. As they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. So there are people that resist this compromise, that resist this inner teaching, this mystery, this occultism. But that which you have already, hold fast till I come. Here's the first reference to the coming of Christ. So obviously we've moved from a time period when the church knew what truth was, became complacent, moved to a time when there was great persecution and the church was cleansed, Smyrna, Myr. Then a period of compromise, Pergamos, when truth and error became intermingled to a time period when man sets himself up as standard to decide right and wrong and becomes religion for you, rather than the word. And then we get into pure occultism. Hold fast till I come. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Well, here is the Justinian uh, pillar. There it is, this one over here commemorating the decree that man can now decide who is on the right side and not, and has the right to punish him even to death. Pillars are brought in. Egyptian pillars. These are symbols, phallic symbols of Osiris. This is paganism. You will find them particularly in Rome, of course, right in the center in the Vatican, you will find this tremendous pillar of uh, Tut Moses III, the very pharaoh of the Exodus. The triple crown, which is from Medo-Persia, represents actually God of heaven, the earth, and the netherworld. Wow! That's quite something to be crowned with a crown that makes you king of heaven, earth, and the netherworld? That's taking the place of someone else? Well, obviously we need some renewal. The church of the Middle Ages became darkness, and it was known as the Dark Ages. So the next time period is Sardis. A.D. 1517 to 1798. It means renewal. The time periods we will come to later as to why these particular time periods are relevant. Renewal, that which remains. Literally, Sardis means reformation then. Isn't that incredible? That God should have this in the sequence? The city was impregnable, but was taken twice without resistance. Once by Cyrus, who was king of Medo-Persia, and Antiochus, Greek king, Antiochus the Great. Let's read about this Reformation period. Revelation 3 verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, the teachers, in his hands, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Here was a renewal, here was new life in the church, something had been discovered, idolatry had been set aside, and there was life, but this life was not complete enough to make it life, there was death in it. 
Be watchful. Strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. This is a terrible testimony. So here was life coming, and there were things that had to be restored that were dead, that were now have to be restored to life, but they're ready to die. Doctrines, teachings. For I have not found thy works perfect, complete, before God. So obviously the Reformation, although it breathed new life into the doctrine of Christ, did not have perfect works. It was not complete. Something was left undone. It's very interesting that at the Council of Trent, there was a major, major issue, and we'll be discussing this a little bit later in the lectures. The major issue was sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone as standard. Rome said no. Bible and tradition. And tradition is the context in which the word must be evaluated. So tradition, man, is the one who supersedes and controls the issues of the Bible. That was the position of Rome. And man was the one who determined how it should be read. So the church decides what's right and wrong for you, not the word. The Reformation said no. Sola Scriptura, sola gratia, saved by grace and grace alone, saved by Jesus Christ. And the Word is the standard whereby we live. That was the issue. Who won at the Council of Trent? Good question. Rome won. The Reformation lost at the Council of Trent. Sad. I'll show it to you in a future lecture. The Reformation lost. A split came, yes. A split came, but the Reformation lost. They had the greatest opportunity in the history of the world to complete the works and to win, but they lost. Why? Because Rome could prove that their traditions superseded the Word. The Reformation wasn't doing what it was preaching. The Reformation had said sola scriptura, the word and the word alone, and then the church asked, do you keep all the teachings? Why do you follow Rome in some issues and leave the Bible alone? Why did you set it aside? A cardinal got up and made a speech, I'll come to it in a future lecture, and said, why are you accepting our tradition over the word? You are transgressing your own precepts. You mean nothing. You are just a rebellion. And the Reformation lost on that issue. It wasn't perfect before God. Sad story. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. That's a sad story too. If you reject light sooner or later, you won't be able to discern the time you are living in. And the coming of Christ will be a total surprise. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. So all was not wrong with the Reformation. The Reformation was a wonderful, powerful tool. It just didn't finish the job. It didn't go all the way. The work was not complete before God. And they shall walk with me in white. I wonder who they are. Could it be Johann Hus? Could it be Tyndall? Could it be Wycliffe? Could it be Martin Luther? Could it be all those great reformers? They are worthy. They stood for what they understood to be truth. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. By the way, this is an interesting text. It doesn't say there, I will write his name in the book of life. It says, I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Wow! What does that tell you about God? 
How many people does God want to be saved? Everybody. Did you know that every person ever born was written in the book of life? And his choice decides whether he stays there or goes. Sad story. Anyway, this is Sardis, what it looked like. That's all that's left from him. This is a, a Muslim lady that accompanied us on that tour. Wonderful uh, story. She accepted Christianity and uh, had to run for her life as a consequence. Anyway, here's an old Byzantine church covered in. A farm is in it. This is an old synagogue that has been opened up over here and cleaned out. This is probably where Paul taught. And uh, maybe Paul was in the synagogue in Sardis. If we go into history, well, this is the city of Prague. And uh, today, pretty industrial, but the ancient city is very, very beautiful. One of the most beautifully preserved old cities in Europe. Very, very impressive. This is where Johann Hus preached. And here's a statue in his memory, in front of these old buildings. And here is a song which they sang. Now, I can't read uh, this Czech language over here. But in any case, this song is against the king of Babylon. Wow! This Hussite, Johann Hus, preached against the king of Babylon. And he preached that this king of Babylon was taking the place of Jesus Christ. And Hus was declared a heretic and sentenced to death at the stake. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which are not have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Here's the old bridge over the river in Prague. And here they used to hang the body parts of the Hussites, who rejected the teachings of Rome and chose the teachings of the Bible. So if they were caught, then they cut off pieces and they hung them here for all to see. So you'd have a corpse hanging there, an arm, a leg, a head, dangling to remind you that it was not worth your while to go contrary to the teachings of the Church of the Middle Ages. As you cross this bridge today, you will find the pagan saints there, Back in their place, here's a lady putting her hand on this image. You can see how this bronze image over here is shiny from all the people who put their hands there because they believe if they put their hands there, they will receive a special blessing. This is a, a Catholic saint who apparently died here by being dangling, dangled over the bridge. Actually, he was pulled up, so they say. And if you put your hand there, you receive a special blessing. So now you can receive a blessing through the activities of man. That's what the Hussites were fighting against. Man's elevation over Christ. Symbols of sun worship, uh, the signs of the zodiac. Here is a Jesuit enclave over there with the letters IHS, Isis, Horus, Set, the Egyptian trinity. The churches are being modified. Here's a health resorts, where you can buy some healthy foods. Here is Martin Luther. And here on this very stairway, which is called La Santa Scala, Martin Luther got up from his knees and said, the just shall live by faith. You see, this stairway, it is claimed, was the stairway where Christ walked when he was sentenced to death by Pilate. And then one night, miraculously, the angels took the stairway from Jerusalem and plonked it down in Rome. That's how it got to be there. And then they built this cathedral around it. And today, if you go up on it on your knees, you can receive a special blessing and 90 days absolution. You can still get it today. That means for 90 days, you can do whatever you like and be forgiven ahead of time. I looked at these young people and old people crawling up here 
trying to find forgiveness for whatever it is they had done or wished to do. Isn't that sad? When all you have to do is look at Jesus and say, here I am, Lord, I am a sinner, forgive me. And Jesus will look down and says, I do not condemn you, go and sin no more. What a wonderful way of finding forgiveness. Here stand for Kaiser und Reich Martin Luther 1521. He has stood before the emperor and the kingdom Martin Luther. And he said, here I stand, I can do no other. Either it's the word or it's not the word. By the way, Martin Luther realized even where his works were not complete. But he couldn't do everything. His followers should have followed on, but they did not. And there he stood. And, well, that's history. The work was not completed. And so what happened? Because Martin Luther couldn't complete the work, another Christian denomination rose and said, Hey, Martin, you missed out on something. And they started a new denomination. And they followed the new leader who was maybe called, whatever, Calvin. And they called themselves Calvinists. And then someone else discovered, hey, Calvin and Martin, you did not realize that the Bible teaches something else over here, you know? And then you have the Baptists. And they have some more information, and they add it. And the Lutherans say, well, Martin didn't see that, so neither do we. And the Calvinists say, well, we didn't see that either, so we're not going to follow that route. And then you have Wycliffe saying, whoa, you know, here's something great here that we've discovered in the Bible. Come, Protestant fellows, let's do this. Hey, no, you better do it on your own. <laughs> Form your own denomination. And so what happened? You have all these Christian denominations. Each with their doctrines, which are based on the Bible, but each claiming to have something other from the other that keeps them separate. Don't we all have the same Bible, yes or no? Don't we all have the same truth if we have one Bible, yes or no? Then why so many denominations? Can't we find out what the truth is and do it? Well, then comes Philadelphia, 1798 to 1844. Philadelphia means brotherly love. Attalus II built it because he loved his brother, Imenus. And it was a gateway through the mountains. It was an open door. Well, this is an interesting time because after the Reformation had been completed, that's when world mission started. Carey went to India, 1793. Morrison to China, 1807. Moffat to Africa, 1817. British Bible Society started in 1804. American Bible Society, 1816. The word went to the world. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, brotherly love, write, These things says he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. This is an interesting concept. Something's opening up and something's closing down. So God opens the way for world mission and it goes up. But there's also something else that's opening and closing here. There were gates, doors if you like, between the compartments of the sanctuary. And when we come into the next time period, we will find that we are no longer in the holy, but in the most holy. Ha! Huh. So Jesus' ministry must have shifted from the holy to the most holy. But that's another concept that we won't deal with in detail now. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength, small group, and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. There's no reproof here. A small group decides they will follow Christ in everything. All truth. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. So there are Satan's church in the world, which say they are Jews, Christians. And are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. So here is a group that finds truth, and something is being restored. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. 
back to the Word. So obviously, something is being done differently. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, so they won't be here right at the end. So it's a period just before the last groups on earth, which shall come upon the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. What did he say in the previous church? I am coming soon. Now I come quickly. You see, that time is shorter now. So obviously we've moved in history through time, from a time when he's coming soon, when his coming is not mentioned, to a time when he's coming soon, to a time now when he's coming quickly. This is before the last events. But this group will not go into the final events because they will be kept from the hour of temptation. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Revelation 3, 9 to 11. What happened in history? Well, if you go to Philadelphia, you'll find a few ruins of some Byzantine churches there. It's very Middle Ages. And uh, this old lady has an interesting connotation for me. She taught me an interesting lesson. She gave a big hug and a kiss to a lady that was very sad, who was being marginalized by everyone else, and gave me a stern look of rebuke. And uh, I remember that look because it taught me something. It taught me that I must regard people as of more value than what they do. But uh, that's a different story for another time. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Tremendous. Be part of the saved. And he shall go no more out. Eternal life. And I will write upon him the name of my God. God's character will be in him. And the name of the city of my God. The character of my people. Which is New Jerusalem which cometh down from heaven. Note. Not a city with bad sewage down here on earth. No. It comes down from heaven, from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Revelation 3.12. These are great promises to this church. So Philadelphia, a time of renewal, when the teachings of the Bible were taken in their fullness again and combined into one teaching, following everything in the Bible, the Bible also went into the whole world. With Satan there, trying to confuse the issue, and God's people supposedly there to represent righteousness and truth. And then comes the last church, Laodicea. And if we take the prophecy of Daniel, where the 2,300 day prophecy ends with uh, this interesting date, 1844, we'll have a whole lecture on it, so let's not get into that, it gets too complicated. Laodicea means nation of judgment. So that means the last one. This is an anti-typical, if you like, Yom Kippur. Christ is in the most holy now because we've moved from candlesticks and showbreads and altars of incense to Ark of the Covenant. So he's moved into the next phase. A Yom Kippur, a time of judgment. Very interesting. Now this city, Antiochus built it and named it after his wife, Laodicea. She was Lauduis. It was a health resort. They had eye salve that they made, very famous one, which was called Collyrium. So they were there to give spiritual eyesight, if you like. It was a very wealthy city. It was destroyed in AD 60 by an earthquake. Rebuilt with own funds, no state funds. They were wealthy. They had it all, and they had a health resort. Those are the ruins of Laodicea. Some of it is still being dug up. Here's an old amphitheater that's not being excavated yet. And they had this fascinating system. Here's an old pipe system. Notice all this insulation around these pipes. Tremendous stuff. They put all these pipes into these, these heavy uh, systems and piped the water to this town. Now, not too far away, there are hot wells, but there were none in Laodicea, so they piped it here, and 
the water went in hot, and a wonderful feat of engineering, when it came out at Laodicea, the water was no longer hot, it was lukewarm. If you drank it, lukewarm, you got nauseous and you threw up. If you made it hot, you could drink it, you know, like tea, you could drink it. If you made it ice cold, you could also get it down. So like today, where you have these salt cures and you drink these waters, you could get it down, but as it arrived there, it was lukewarm. Fascinating story in archaeology. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Aha. I would that thou wert cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Revelation 3, 15 and 16. Notice that the rebuke is not, I will come and take your candlestick and give it to someone else. The rebuke is, I will spit you out. Ha! Huh. You see, this is the last church on earth. There's no taking away of the candlestick. There's only a spitting out. So this church goes through to the kingdom. But those that are lukewarm will have to be spat out of it. This church will be shaken. And those that do not conform will be shaken up. So is this a perfect church, yes or no? No, it's pathetic. Notice that it is lukewarm and that there is no commendation, only a rebuke. No commendation whatsoever. It's the only one that has no commendation. Nothing. Not too far away, there's Heriopolis, where there are the really hot springs, but there it was lukewarm. Today, many, many health resorts with all these beautiful calcium carbonate deposits and all these little hot wells down there are all over the place. It's a very beautiful place. They still make healthy food there as well. Amphitheaters. This uh, camel, I think, needs a tooth job. <laughs> Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. Wow, this church is in trouble. Here's a little boy gathering geber. It's a little uh, substance that is used in the health industry to take pain away. It's like an anesthetic. So even today, this area is known for its health herbs. You see, there is a health message associated with Laodicea. Something for the physical body. But unfortunately, they are rich. Now, is God interested in literal riches, yes or no? No. So, in what are they rich? Spiritual. Yes. They have biblical knowledge. They have biblical knowledge. You see, the Reformation had not completed the job. The Reformation became fragmented because of an incomplete job. Then Philadelphia time period came along and the consolidation took place and the word was again unraveled in all its fullness and Laodicea inherited the knowledge. Here they were. They had the knowledge. And what do they do with it? Sit on it. And what do they do? They become rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing. They start playing church. The church is supposed to be the light of the world, but these people play church. And they do not know that they are wretched and miserable, and poor, spiritually poor, and blind, they don't have discernment, and they are naked, they are devoid of Christ. You see, faith without works is dead. Whereas works doesn't earn you any brownie points, because you are saved by grace and grace alone, if you do not share that which you know, 
well then you have a problem. And if you are rich, if you believe that you have the truth, well then, why share it with someone else? It might, might make you uncomfortable. And there are people that might believe that they have the truth and that the truth will save them. Well, the Jews believed that. And they had the truth. But they rejected the Messiah and nailed him to a cross. Didn't they do that? So to have the truth doesn't save you. To have Jesus Christ saves you. And if you have Jesus Christ, you will go out. And you will not condemn those who know not the truth. You will love those who know not the truth and try and win them over to the truth. Because Jesus died for you and for me while we were yet sinners, right or wrong. And that's the way it's going to be. And let me tell you something. Nobody and I'm going to say this very harshly, nobody is saved by his right understanding of any doctrine. Have you got that? If you have the perfect knowledge on how to be saved, is that going to save you? No. If you sit on it and you have it and you're rich and increased in goods, that's not going to save you. Applying it to the hearts and making Jesus the center and the Alpha and the Omega of your life, that is saving knowledge with works. But to sit on it won't save you. Now, if you become so rich and increased in goods that you start arguing on this issue and that issue, and I have the perfect understanding of this doctrine, and therefore I am right and you are wrong and you are lost and I am saved. This church is so full of knowledge that it has time to debate the issue round and round like a dog with its mouth and its tail running round and round in circles and getting nowhere. This church is wretched and miserable. So if you're looking for the perfect end time church, you will not find it. You have to look for one that's miserable and poor and blind and wretched. Then you might have found it. How's that? I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. So how do you get rich? And how do you get the robes of righteousness? And how do you cover the shame of your nakedness? And how do you get spiritual discernment and I solve, so that you can see? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So if you want to do what is right, God will put you in the fire of affliction. So I have bad news. Anybody who finds this truth, it's hot. And you will have to take care of yourself and eat gebre. Here there's a knocking on the door. And here there is a beautiful field ready for the harvest. I took this standing on my knees, taking it across. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. God doesn't force anyone. And I will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, there's some overcoming to be done, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and I am set down with my father in his throne. Revelation 3.20. That's the history of the church. Finally, I have to tell you that there are people on this earth who have a knowledge of the truth. But they're not very well known for spreading it. They're rather well known for sitting on it and arguing amongst themselves as to the particulars of each particular point and as to their perfection or non-perfection in this issue or that. That's not the issue. Jesus is the issue. Truth is important but only if it is applied to the hearts. And I pray that we all may understand and gain a knowledge of the truth, but that we far more, lest we become clanging symbols, find Jesus and apply him to our hearts. In the next lectures we will find out how truth has been thrown to the ground on this planet and what trouble we are really in. 
and who controls what and how they do it. May God bless you and keep you and come to the next lectures as we unfold the whole battle between good and evil. Thank you for coming.